as he says, uh, to speak with um, individuals who had fled Russia under Putin. Uh, he met with dozens in the former Soviet republics of Georgia and Armenia, and he spoke uh, by Zoom with many other Russian exiles in France, Germany, Britain, Switzerland, Cyprus, uh, and the United States. As many as one million people are said to have left Russia since the invasion of Ukraine two years ago, among them leading cultural, media, political, and business figures. And on the whole, Paul says, this now vast community of exiles remains vibrant and, and defiant. Uh, they may be in retreat, he says, but they're not defeated. In fact, uh, Paul asserts, the rebellion of the exiles is not a passing phase, but one that has the potential to achieve its objective of a better Russia. At the same time, uh, Paul's reporting shows that those who have left had uh, many different motivations for going. Uh, they're now also widely dispersed, lack unity, and are prone to the infighting typical of exile communities. So, so it's a complicated situation. Uh, Paul's book, uh, by the way, is, uh, is part of a series from Columbia Global Reports. Um, and if, if you're not familiar with this series, I, I, I urge you to, uh, to get to know it. Uh, CGR is a publishing imprint from uh, Columbia University that commissions authors to do uh, original reporting uh, on a wide range of important issues. And the books are, are like this, you know, pretty, pretty compact and concise. Uh, but like Paul's, they tend to be timely and, and packed with, uh, with lots of relevant information. Uh, Kirkus uh, called Paul's book a remarkable story of brave people looking to the future. And Publishers Weekly said it offers captivating insights into a community in crisis. A conversation uh, with Paul uh, will be Fiona Hill, uh, who has several decades of experience as a policy expert on Russia, uh, working in both uh, government and uh, academia. She served in three administrations under George W. Bush, Obama, and Trump. And many of you, uh, no doubt, um, will recall her riveting testimony at Trump's first uh, impeachment uh, inquiry. She's now a, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. And, and last, last summer, and this is really cool, she also took on the position of Chancellor of Britain's Durham University. And Durham's her, ho her hometown. So... They really appreciate her back there. Uh, her memoir in uh, 2021, There Is Nothing For You Here, uh, became a bestseller. And she's uh, co-authored both a book on Putin and one on Siberia. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Paul Sterabin and Fiona Hill. Well, thank you very much, Sabraz. Um, I'm the MC here, so um, I have to uh, get us all situated and started. Can everybody hear okay now? Yeah? Okay, excellent. Um, it's actually a fantastic pleasure for me to be here uh, with Paul. Um, we've known each other a long time, and we were just actually talking in the green room there how about we've certainly known each other for the entirety of Vladimir Putin's presidency which is 25 years now, guys, you know, this is a long time. So we were kind of, you know, reminiscing yeah. about, you know, the good old days at the very beginning yeah. and, you know, every, the way everything has um, played out. And as Brad um, rightly said, um, Paul is actually one of uh, the journalists and writers who has really covered Russia and the regions of the former Soviet Union in incredibly great depth. He spent a lot of time in Central Asia. He's gone back, you know, there to um, interview people, the Caucasus. He's written on many, um, you know, similar themes here in the United States um, as well. So we're going to have a, a very rich conversation. And the one thing that I want to say, you know, about the book, which I had the pleasure of reading in its uh, draft form, is it really is packed with historical insight. And you know, I think um, one of the first questions that I'm, you know, going to put to Paul, that Brad already 
and had talked about this is, of course, that there is a long history of exile. Maybe some of you here are the, in fact, I can see a couple of people who I know are, in fact, the offspring or the descendants um, of exiles from previous waves, waves out of Russia, you know, from uh, the imperial period, you know, going back, you know, certainly a long uh, time. Paul's own family, you know, came at some point out of the old pale of settlement from uh, Belarus uh, in the um, uh, imperial period. So we've we've had in Kiev as well, and we've uh, obviously got huge waves of people coming out of uh, of Ukraine today, not just out of Russia. So I think you're not really asking Paul to set the scene for us and how this current wave of exiles really fits into the historical period is a good place of starting because one of the main questions is what role, as you know, Brad was saying, can exiles really genuinely play in the country that they have left in terms of thinking about the future? And the history certainly gives us some hints of that. Thank you, Fiona. Um, I, you know, I'd hate to kind of measure my life by the number of years that Vladimir Putin has occupied. It's becoming it's, a measure. <laughs> it's becoming, yeah, it's, it's taking up an increasingly uh, large ch chunk of the years. Um, but, you know, all things must pass, we can hope. So, yeah, I mean, part of the attraction of, of the book was, other than being kind of generally interested in the exile experience, was to sort of have a special, I have a special fascination with the Russian experience in exile. And I think that's partly because uh, in Russia, the exile is sort of the flip side of uh, autocracy, of repressive government, which is a, you know, more or less constant in Russian history uh, with a few interruptions, but not all that many. So you could probably date the more sort of modern exile period to the 19th century and people like Alexander Herzen, who founded the the Bell, and he, Herzen fled Russia. He was an extremely, you know, literate uh, man with a lot of passion for reforming Russia, for abolishing serfdom, for example. And he somehow managed to have this pipeline of information that flowed to him out of Tsarist Russia into London or Paris or wherever he was, and he published it. And the word was that um, even the czar, you know, would would get these reports of various forms of, you know, corruption and iniquity in Russia. And when the czar Alexander II came to power and certain reforms like uh, the about abolition of, of of serfdom, you you could say this was sort of how you know it, the, the exiles helped to kind of put that uh, in the air. And I think. One of the functions that exiles can play in that respect is to be custodians of a vision of Russia which is better than and at odds with the sort of prevailing autocratic norms um, to generalize. And I think that was mission was accomplished in that portion of the 19th century. And Russia also became less warlike during that period, which again, you know, they were preoccupied with these internal reform. So that's something of a benchmark. And then we, you know, we, we get to the revolutionary period, of course, where Trotsky and Lenin and others are spending the better part of their lives at work in exile and never gave up in terms of their hope uh, for deposing the czar and putting into place, you know, what they regarded at least as a vision of a better you know, society, and that worked, and then things petered out, you know, the whites all left Russia, be, but became famously disputatious, and just the fragments became smaller and smaller, and accomplished essentially nothing, uh, and and now with, with Putin's time, we see this new period of, of exile, which I think, you know, the, the bells, resonate back to these earlier times. It's almost like a, a habit, you know, of, of, of being Russian in some sense that at, at some point, you know, you might find yourself somewhere else. Yeah, and there's a real trade-off between the political side of this, which as you say, in some cases like Alexander Hetzen, could have had some impact. And then, you know, the other flip side of exile in terms of arts and culture in which, you know, exiles make an enormous contribution. I mean, I was just looking around here, and I'm sure that all of us could just start looking around the bookshelves. 
thinking of people like Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who actually does have an impact, you know, when he returns, perhaps not the one we might have all hoped, uh, you know, given, um, you know, some of the, the works that he did do in exile. I mean, he actually maybe has contributed in some respects, you know, in a rather controversial way to some of Putin's present thinking, you know, about Russia. But you've got people like Nabokov, uh, you have, yes. you know, so many other, um, you know, writers who um, develop all literary genres, different genres, you know, in exile and contribute uh, I mean, different ways. But it's that political element of it, which is really, I think, difficult to pass out and hard to kind of figure out. Will exiles now in you know places like Germany or France or here in the United States be able to have that role in shaping you know the future? Because it clearly comes out in your book that they want to do that. Yeah, and I, I mean, I wanted to inveigh also against this idea of the exile as as just being kind of in this netherland or just you know a state of permanent melancholy or just the kind of a dissipated life, um, which sometimes the literature of exile reflects, including uh, Nabokov. But, but you also have, you know, as today, this this sort of tradition where there is tremendous activism, tremendous ferment, and it's, it's political, but it's also being expressed in cultural forms. I've become interested lately. This has not come out so much in my book, but I think it's gelled a kind of cultural yeah. resistance. Right. The uh, the pop singer known as Little Coin, Munechka, I mean, she's got this anthem, uh, uh, I will survive, you know, uh, ya perija vu, you know, and, and my exile friends tell me that they, you know, can be in tears when they listen to this. And so sometimes it's, it's that kind of cultural message that can resonate more than an overt you know, political protests. And so, which could become tiresome. I mean, I mean, how many times yeah. can I be on the streets? But but I do think there's a certain coherence to today's version of the exile movement that is that does find I I expression in, in people like uh, Monetushka. And there's also, I mean, the way that you've just described there with exiles projecting out to the rest of the exile community, but then the role that exiles play in the places that they end up. Now, you know, when you think about some of the places that you went to, Caucasus and Central Asia, mm -hmm. um, where there's a lot of controversy about, you know, the sort of the return of um, so many Russians. Indeed. Uh, because, you know, the, the, they've been trying to carve their own uh, paths um, since the collapse of the Soviet Union. You know, they, they didn't particularly want to have more settlement, you know, of Russians. There's a, a kind of upheaval that that has created, particularly in places like Tbilisi in Georgia. And, you, you know, you talk about this in the book. Yeah. And we've seen plenty Yerevan. of articles. Mm -hmm. But there's also, you know, when we think about here in the United States or in Europe, I mean, we've benefited. All my professors, when I was, you know, kind of studying Russian um, history, were exiles from somewhere. Sometimes it was Poland. I mean, Richard Pipes was, you know, one of my professors. Sometimes it was from Ukraine. Roman Spolok was another. But often it was from Russia, and they were often Russian dissidents. I mean, the people who taught me Russian and, you know, Russian sociology were all exiles from the Soviet uh, period, often operating under pseudonyms, you know, but they played an enormous uh, role in shaping the way that, you know, the rest of us, you know, thought about Russia or, you know, the rest of the region. So there's that kind of, you know, different tension there. Now, how do you see that playing out at this point? Well, I think that um, the exiles right now are feeling pressed, not only by the Kremlin in, in Moscow, because as, as Brad described in his introduction, there, you know, there's the Duma right now in Moscow is literally, you know, pushing through legislation that would you know, confiscate their assets and this kind of thing. But at the same time, and particularly in, in some of the Eastern European and, and Southern Caucasus countries, the exiles are being pressed by their host countries who are kind of wondering, you know, well, how long are these people going to stay? And are they good people or not good people? And one of the arguments I try to advance in the book is that there are good Russians. Of course. Uh, well, you say, of course, <laughs> yeah. but um, there is... That's controversial at the moment, though, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, this question engages in Ukraine. As well. I was in right. Ukraine late last year, not for the book, really, but still, it, it connected with some themes. And there... You know, there is a, a kind of per perspective among some Ukrainians, not not all of them, of course, that, you know, the, there is something kind of essential about the Russian that is deadly and poisonous to Ukraine. And so one has to grapple with that. But what I found in, in my reporting and meeting people in places like Tbilisi and 
in Yerevan and often in sort of almost random encounters because, you know, I knew where I would find these people, but I didn't necessarily know who they were. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I would see how this all kind of registers for them. Right. And, and it wasn't abstract. So, well, can I tell one story? Yes, of please a, do. Yeah. Because, I, you know, you, you, if you do it this, this long enough, you begin to feel like you've adopted these people as your, your characters, uh, and they become in some way close to your heart. So I met Nastya in Yerevan, and uh, just at one of these events where people were sort of generally telling me about their, their life there, and I thought there was something interesting about her. wasn't quite sure what, but when we went to dinner, and she just, you know, her story was that she grew up in a, a village uh, in northern Russia uh, near the border with Finland, and her mother told her that she must have nothing to do with politics. You know, politics was completely, yeah. you know, the wrong way to turn, nothing but trouble. She went to the Medical Institute in St. Petersburg, very prestigious, you know, and this was a time when there were anti-Putin protests on the street, which you would have absolutely nothing to do with. You know, she told me she would rather you know, put a gun to her head than, than to risk her, you know, her medical diploma. It meant that much to her. And yet the war, you know, the, right. the full-scale invasion in February uh, 2022, something snapped. Uh, she left uh, with her not terribly political husband, uh, and they went to Yerevan. So she had nothing really to do there anymore, with her, at least with her medical training. Um, she, for the first time, participated in a anti-Putin protest on the streets of Yerevan. Her mother saw the footage, because Russian state television is very interested in, in capturing this kind of stuff, called Nasty up and screamed at her and said, you know, you're an enemy of the, the state and uh, you're probably being paid by the anti-Putin opposition. So, you know, many tears and called her back the next day and said, well, probably you're sincere. And they kind of left it at that. Nastya is, is an example of someone who was just, she's completely, you know, guilt ridden and, and, you know, filled with shame, basically, you know. Blood is on her hands over Ukraine. I found her, you know, learning Ukrainian uh, and wanting to go back to you, go to Ukraine for the first time to see if she could help, you know, restore and rebuild the country. So in a way, we have a kind of, and I say without irony, a, a woke Russian. Uh, and, and so I met a number of these, these sorts of people who were kind of, I think, seeing and experiencing Russia in a d different way than certainly they had been educated to so to some degree it's a it's a matter of uh of vision and, and as you bring out in the book when you look um you know as i said it's really jam-packed for something that's uh, so slim um uh when you look at the other waves of exile you see all of those tensions there as well which you bring out very well there are people who are like nastia who feel guilty and just you know want to find some way of, of addressing that there are others who see themselves atoning yeah, atoning, yeah and there are others who see themselves a kind of government in exile I mean, I just spent a, a bunch of time in uh, Germany and mm -hmm. it seemed like in Berlin, uh, you know, half of uh, Moscow was there. And also thinking then about how they might return, you know, to Russia. Of course, Lenin did that, <laughs> you know, uh, back in the, in the revolution on the sealed train, thanks to the German high command, you know, to basically try to transform the country. A lot of people talking about, mm -hmm. you know, how they would be able to transform Russia into a parliamentary democracy, just kind of waiting for the opportunity to go move beyond Putin. And of course, you fail famously got someone who did return from Germany, Alex, Alexei Navalny, you know, from um, obviously after being poisoned, yes. going back in a rather dramatic fashion. And, you know, people are, you know, grappling with that tension as well. So, you know, perhaps you could reflect on, you know, those aspects of this as well. Yeah. So, um, well, again, one of my exiles is uh, Daniel, who I also met in Yerevan, and he's a very hardened Navalny guy. You know, and I almost think of these people as like the hard men, like we used to talk about the IRA, you know, really professional almost and methodical and, and unsentimental in their approach to, to politics and, 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 and to life. And so what's unique about the Navalny organization uh, is I think that unlike some of the others, 
in exile like Khodorkovsky or uh, Garry Kasparov. He, Navalny had a, and has a real organization inside of, of Russia, you know, made up of people like Danya. So, so for example, how did he get started in this? You know, he was, uh, he called his parents, he grew up in, in uh, Omsk in, in Siberia. His parents were what he called them, Bunichikovs. They were basically people who lived on the, the government uh, pension and, and salaries. And so in a way we're kind of chained to it. And he didn't knew that he didn't, he didn't want that. And then all these economic troubles in Russia after the annexation of Crimea and the sanctions by the West made his own life difficult. He was in construction and he found himself, first it was the communist party, and then he got involved with Navalny and they paid him to be an organizer. And uh, when Navalny was poisoned, it took place Omskin, he was there. He kept vigil over Navalny, who is a very charismatic presence. I haven't been in his presence, but everyone who has describes him as the kind of person who can who can fill a room and has that kind of, you know, or aura about him. So this Dinah is utterly devoted to Navalny and he's all in. These people are distinct from a lot of the other exiles because they cannot go back to Russia without facing severe right. reprisals. Uh, they've committed themselves. So they wait for the day, you know, they have a slogan, while Putin lives, you know, uh, they, they can, you know, they will go back only when he's dead, which they hope it will be like, you know, tomorrow. Uh, so, you know, this is essentially the life, of, I think, of a revolutionary. Right. And I think for Navalny himself, I think it was an act on, in, on his part, at least, of defiance to go back. Uh, maybe he thought this is exactly what they don't want me to do, don't expect me to do, and my example will somehow be, you know, will be inspirational in a, a kind of living, you know, martyrdom sort of way. And I think he has, you know, I mean, yeah. the Navalny organization is, is unique for having that level of, you know, dedication and commitment. And Navalny also really underscores that dilemma of exile, right? Because he talks about the importance of being in Russia as a Russian, being close to the soil, even if he's actually in prison, he's still... I mean, it's amazing how he's always getting these missives, you know, to the most remote uh, places, you know, that he, that he possibly can. And his most recent emphasises that. And in a way, it's almost a challenge to people who have decided to be in exile. It is. Uh, and I think that that's kind of, you know, one of the elements that makes things so difficult, you know, to, to, to contemplate. Because... You know, we talked a little earlier that exile is a very specific thing. Yeah. You know, for those of us who might have moved, you know, somewhere and become naturalized citizens like myself, we're not really exiles. You know, you're really kind of trying to move yourself away from something. But there's an an, an idea in packed into that word of exile that somehow you might, you know, kind of go back and do something. Yeah, I think one maybe ceases to be an exile when one is more or less fully absorbed into the, you know, the host country, uh, as happened with generations of, of people who left America for various reasons. And my grandparents, I don't think they regarded themselves as exiles. Right. I mean, they were, I think, very happy, you know, no longer to be in the, in the Pale of Settlement for some very good reasons. Uh, but I think the Russians, I mean, these people, I mean, certainly the, the, the political view, but a lot of the other ones, I mean, they, they really haven't adapted yet some of them will, but to their, you know, to the host countries. I also think, even though it's a gross generalization, that I don't know that the Russians um, assimilate that well. It's, it's. I mean, they're they're uh, tied to their language, their culture, uh, sometimes their traditions. I've had conversations with exiles, uh, notorious people like you know Boris Berezovsky. Remember. Yep. You know, Berezovsky, he was one of the prominent oligarchs that helped to make Putin. And then he went into exile uh, in London. And I met him when he was in his clubhouse in Moscow, which looked like my idea of a French whorehouse, you know, <laughs> or maybe something connected with Las Vegas and you know, red velvet. And, you know, he rang a little bell and, and a, a white jacketed waiter came out and filled our glasses with a uh, Saint, Saint-Emilion or 
water. <laughs> not water. Uh, so he was at the top of his game. And the next thing you know, he's, he's uh, you know, in London in exile. He's nursing uh, Alexander Litvinenko, who was another exile. This is the early crew uh, who, who died of, of uh, polonium, <clears throat> radioactive poisoning put in his tea, probably by uh, someone connected to the Russian security services. So I went to London. I met with, <laughs> I had tea with Litvinenko. <laughs> Uh, you know, I guess that worked out all, all right. And then I went out for lunch with uh, with Boris, you know, and his bodyguards in, you know, a nice Italian restaurant in Mayfair. And he was almost in tears telling me how much he missed Russia, you know, the smell of the earth, the mushrooms. I mean, you know, you name it. He had all these classifications for different kinds of nationalities. And the Russian was, you know, very was drawn to extremes and all these things. And, you know, it was it was really too much. And I, you know, undiplomatically asked him if he had ever killed anyone, uh, which I don't know, somehow that wasn't on my list of questions. But, you know, he had lived a little bit the life of a gangster in in, uh, in Moscow. And he looked at me like, what are you out of your mind? You know, we're not going to discuss that. So these exiles come in all varieties. And we think, you know, Boris Berzovsky died, I think, by suicide. Some people will question that. Um, and you know that was that was one way, one way to go. Well, that is that is another aspect of um, not the people that you interview really for the book, but that you know the weight of exile for political the of exile. Uh, 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 opponents to Putin. I mm mean, -hmm. um, so many murders and assassinations, obviously attempts, Navalny, you know, in, yeah. included. Uh, that, they're being know, that, followed now. Yeah, and thinking about Trotsky, you know, back in Mexico City. I mean, we have a long, yeah. uh, well, the, very difficult tradition. The, the, the axe right? in yeah, the back of the head by yeah. Stalin's uh, yeah. agent. Which does actually show that the Russian state, um, at various points in the Soviet Union, the Russian Empire was nervous uh, about exiles, even if Alexander II might have found Alexander Herzen useful. Um, you know, there's got to be some, you know, real concerns there. I mean, Putin did, of course, make a deal with people like Khodorkovsky. Yeah. You know, I'll let you out of jail after 10 years if you stay away. You cannot come back. You know, exactly. You cannot come which back. Is, which so is, is probably an messaging. example for Navalny that he wanted to defy. That unlike Khodorkovsky, he's not making a deal. He's coming back. Yeah. But yeah. But I mean, in, in all of the um, interviews and things that you had there, I mean, as, as Brad said in the introduction, you do have a kind of hopeful sense that does permeate through the book that, you know, perhaps this time maybe, you know, these guys can do something. And, I, you know, I'd like to kind of just unpack before we then, you know, try to bring in uh, the audience about why you think it might be different this time when, you know, you point out in history that, you know, the exiles, with a few exceptions, notable exceptions, really haven't had a lot of traction. Well, one is, as you point out, I think that the Kremlin, I am sure that the Kremlin is is nervous about the exiles. They feel threatened by the exiles. One of the chapters in the book is called The Information Resistance, which is largely the story of TV Rain, which is an exiled, uh, an outlet in exile now in Amsterdam that pumps out uh, Russian language, uh, anti-Putin, anti war and, and other, you know, kinds of programming. Some of it is cultural, but most of it is news and commentary. And they're streaming in Russian back to Russia and people wonder, well, how can that happen? And Putin, for reasons that nobody has really quite identified, has kept open certain channels, including YouTube uh, and Telegram and a lot of others. But there is a great deal of uh, anti-Putin, anti-war, you know, media material available to Russians inside of Russia. And that makes the Kremlin nervous. And if they were not nervous, they would not be going after, you know, comedians and rock bands. And no, this is a life and death struggle. You know, I mean, you cannot even begin to fathom the depth of animosity between this one camp of Russians that believes in, in Putin, you know, led, of course, by the Kremlin himself, but but people in elites and others around him. And there are some raging, you know, chauvinistic nationalists in Russia who think it's yeah. fantastic that the liberal, you know, scum, as, as Putin calls them, have left the country. You know, thank God, at last, you know, we're free of the, the yoke of the the West. And then on the other side are the more westernizing and, and liberal 
elements, and you cannot underestimate the depth of their hatreds either. I mean, as we speak, there are people who are yeah. actively trying to, you know, blow up Putin's train, and it wouldn't be that shocking if it happened. I mean, I talked to an anarchist who gives me meager Bitcoin sums to an anarchist group, you know, back uh, in Russia that does actually blow up train tracks. And uh, I said, why are you telling me this? And <laughs> yeah. you know, Don't tell anybody who he is. Yes, yeah, I mean, I took yeah. it. I said, I'm, not, your book. I'm not printing you your full name <laughs> for your own protection, yeah. Andre. He was like 19 years old. You know, he was like a little... That narrows it down. <laughs> a, little, a little Kropotkin, yeah. you know. So you get, you get, you get some yeah. really radical off the charts right. people. And Putin, they know that. And so, I mean, there's the... When the Russians are fighting with each right. other, there's almost like no fight. Like it's like a it's a civil it's an element of a civil war. It just doesn't get the amount of attention that like the Ukraine thing does, which also actually has some fraternal elements. Yeah. Because it's it's also conducted entirely in the Russian language, so it's really hard for outsiders to follow it to tune in. Yeah. I mean, you just you know we mentioned um, Pyotr Kropotkin, and you know then thinking about Russian history. Yeah. I mean, we just had the hundredth um, anniversary of uh, Lenin's death, January twenty first. And of course, you know, one of the precipitating facts of Lenin uh, dying was a um, assassination attempt by Fanny Kaplan. And I mean, you think about, um, you know, various czars and, you know, kind of yes. being blown up and all the rest of it. I mean, it's not inconceivable, you know, at all. So that element, you know, also driven by people from exile uh, and tied in is definitely something that somebody like Putin would be concerned about. But the other element of why I have some optimism is because as I earlier mentioned, there is a kind of certain kind of custodial function that the exiles play in kind of in preserving, you know, the vision of a better Russia. And I think it's important that they do so because in autocracies, they just want you to believe whatever they want you to believe. And the reality can become very distorted. And I also think there is an underappreciated depth and, and scope to the exile movement, such as it is. I mean, I spent a day in, in Batumi on the shores of the Black Sea in Georgia with a dissident Russian Orthodox priest who, yeah. you know, at one time was preaching paces from the Kremlin. I mean, he had a very prestigious position. And he left with his wife, Russian Orthodox priests are permitted to marry, who was also devoted to the faith. And um, they were devotees of a murdered Russian Orthodox priest named Alexander Men, who was the very famous yeah. murder that took place in the early times of the, in the Soviet uh, collapse. And, and Men's quote, which is in the book, which uh, my, my priest liked to quote to me, was, uh, not, my knowledge is pessimistic, but my faith is optimistic. <laughs> so, you know, they have to have something to sustain themselves. And as you were saying, you know, the idea of how does change occur, it it's not, I think in the West, in America, you know, we're accustomed to, well, every two years we have an election, every four years as a president, you know, this is how things can, no, and in Russia, you know, it's, it can be sudden and, and convulsive, you know, it's like a thunderclap, and there are usually opportunities every yeah. generation or two, and there was such an opportunity with the collapse of the Soviet Union, and for various reasons, including I, I think the West was in some ways complicit, as we've talked about, it didn't work out. And we got instead a kind of reaction and Thermidor type yep. period in Putin. But he's not going to live forever. No, and it could go, you know, in different directions. It could go in different directions. More reformers. I mean, just, you know, to uh, bring people in for the audience, we've got a mic um, over there as well. I mean, you mentioned elections. I mean, technically, Putin's got an election. In March. March 15th to the 17th. You right. know, and it, it looks more like, a, you I know, an anointment. I think we know how it's yeah. going to go. But there is this, you know, kind of alternative uh, candidate, Mr. Nadezhdin, yes. giving everyone literally a little bit of hope, you know, with his name uh, from yes. Nadezhdin. Nadezhdin. And, and he's probably responding to, yes. just like you were talking about, these demands for some kind of change, because he seems to be the change candidate that the Kremlin's allowing to run. So it does also he, reflect he, he, on what you were saying. Well, yeah, I talked to... Uh, uh, Sergei Gurev, who's yeah. sort of a central character. Another exile. He's another exile. He's a very uh, 
sort of the wise men among the exiles, very much in this kind of liberal yeah, reformer yeah. tradition. And he's uh, actually just about to take over as the dean of the London Business School, which oh, wow. I think is good. And yeah. so Sergei was uh, telling me that the exiles, the political exiles have rallied behind Nadezhda, even though they did not. I don't know that anybody really knows exactly who, who he is or what he's about, but, but he says he's against the war and, uh, you know, he's saying the right things. But the real lesson there is they've organized signatures for him to get him on the ballot. And apparently they've got at least 150,000 signatures. And to give one signature, one has to appear in public. They line up, they go to the registry. They have not only their names, but their passport information recorded. So these are people who are basically signing up as known anti-Putin people inside of Russia. So that yeah. tells you something. And we haven't talked about the war so much, but I don't think it's a popular war. No. Uh, you know, they have to pay people, usually people who live very far from Moscow, who can barely eke out a living. Many of them are not ethnic Russians and Bashkiris and all yeah. sorts of people. Big bonuses to conscript and promises to the family that they'll get money, you know, if they die. And, and uh, that's not the sign of a, of a popular war. No, it's not. Well, we have we have a number of uh, questions here, so I'll turn over and hopefully um, we can all hear. But if if people can't hear, I'll repeat the question. But if somebody could signal to make sure we can hear, okay? Yeah, I think I think you can. You can hear at the back. Yeah, great. Okay. okay. Um. Uh, first of all, this is a terrific talk, and it's really interesting to think back on on how far back this Russian exile thing goes. I mean, I think they maybe invented anarchism yeah. <laughs> uh the russian anarchists maybe there Wouldn't were be some surprised. in france yeah but italians i think were, were kind of getting involved in that. but russians were a big deal yeah in the anarchist no question about movement. it mm -hmm. um and um it, and i also wanted to say that you're one of my great heroines oh. um i i would come anywhere i've read all your stuff every time i hear that you're you're going to be on or speaking. I come. Like, well, please read Paul's book. And, I will, <laughs> and, and the book That's sounds great. like it's going to be really it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, for um, some strange reason, I really was interested in having Fiona, you know, kind of join me at this uh, event. <laughs> we've known at the wrong time. <laughs> there a was a, a talk at, at the Kennan Institute that's part of Wilson, mm -hmm. uh, either this morning or yesterday, about the response of the American, of the, of the Russian people to the war. And basically, it, it, they said it was the, the Russian people were very ap apathetic. But it, it, they paid attention, and there were some that were kind of opposed, and mm -hmm. uh, some that were kind of for, and most were just going on with their lives. Yeah. Um, and, I, and, and there's all this other stuff going on, and I wondered if there's how much connection there is between what you're describing and the vast population of Russians. Well, I mean, I think it's a mixed picture. I mean, there are certainly plenty of Russians. One of the reasons they haven't shut down YouTube is is because, you know, a lot of ordinary Russians, I mean, YouTube is like, you know, their children watch cartoons and they mm -hmm. get movie, all kinds of stuff. And so they don't want to just completely close off life. I, I, I do think that there aren't that many people on a daily basis who want this huge diet of, of politics of any kind. And a lot of people tune out state television because it's just, you know, it's just all the same all the oh, time. Wow. And yeah, how much are you going to want to listen to that? But I, I do think there are Russians who, who um, you know, in Moscow, for example, who they keep wanting it to be over. You know, they're, they're sort of waiting, like, you know, how long does this have to go on for? And they're, you know, they're great adapters. And if they can't buy, you know, the kind of phone that they now want to buy in Moscow, they get it through a friend who's in Tashkent or something like that. So, mm -hmm. so they've adapted. But uh, I, I, don't, I don't get the sense that there's, you know, great, you know, happiness at the turn of events and uh, we haven't talked about this but it, you know it could turn out that russia being kind of now rejected again by the west becomes some kind of a vassal of china and you know how how happy is that as an outcome thank you thank you if you could talk a little bit about what exiles are doing to influence the governments where they're living so in mm. the u.s or in europe how they're shaping people's views or just convincing governments there yeah. No, I think that's a good question. I mean, yeah, how much are the exiles influencing the, their host governments? It's actually, I think, more in the reverse. And one of the episodes I described in the book how, was how in Latvia, the, um, the exiled outlet TV Ren 
began its operations after leaving Moscow. And there was a lot of suspicion towards them, as there is suspicion towards Russians generally, as a kind of fifth column in Latvia and the authorities in the government. And it became a huge and intolerable issue. TV Rain regarded itself as umbilically attached to Russia. I mean, it's all one Russian community. So when they referred to like the Russian people or the Russian troops, they would use pronouns like we. And the Latvians violently rejected and said, no, it's they, you know. And there were issues like that. It got to the point where the Latvian authorities revoked the license of TV Rain and they all they had to leave the country and now they've resettled in in Amsterdam as their headquarters. So I don't think that's a good story. I mean, I go back to I think there are, you know, some good Russians and I don't think it behooves, you know, it's understandable why they would be these kinds of suspicions given the the history, but um I think I think it would be better for for the the anti-Putin movement if it was, you know, if there was a broader perspective from governments in places like Latvia uh, towards these exiled Russians and just, what their just activities to are. That, though, there is an effort, and we'll see, you know, how far it goes for, because there are so many Russian exiles in Europe, in Berlin and Paris and, you know, London and elsewhere. Uh, but, it, but on the European side of things, try to see if they can set up a representation for Russians in exile with the European Union. So a little bit like doing how the Poles had their government in exile, or, you know, we've seen this before. And, you know, when I was in Berlin, that was kind of percolating through. So, you know, they're, they're trying to sort of figure out, you know, how they can even adapt to having, you know, because some of them have with their property taken or, you know, not being able or not wanting to renew their passports, where they might be able to get some kind of recognition, not of being stateless, but of being these Russians in exile. So I would watch that as well to see, you know, how that plays out, because it definitely fits into, you know, what you're talking about, about wanting to be engaged and actually want to be engaged with, so that if something changes, they become, you know, part of the process of how we re-engage with Russia writ large over time. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. It's been really great. Um, well, you mentioned that throughout most of its long history, Russia has been an autocracy. That there have been these brief periods where autocracy has lapsed and uh, there have been hopes for uh, something other than than autocracy. Mm -hmm. And I remember that at the end of the Soviet Union, for example, there was high, there were high hopes, of course, that things would change there and right. some form of self-government or at least representative government, something mm -hmm. would take hold and everything looked right. But again, it lapsed. I mean, and again, it uh, returned to uh, autocracy, it has returned. Uh, and I remember at that time, there were a lot of people who were, uh, even among along with the great hopes there were a lot of people who were saying well uh, it's a big problem the russians have never really had anything other than uh, autocracy and they really aren't capable of it mm. um so i guess it, to put this in a question what do you either of you that's a good question for both of you think about what the what the possibilities are uh if if and when putin is when Putin dies, when, uh, whenever, when things change as far as the current regime goes, what are the possibilities that the country itself is capable of, to use mm -hmm. that word, capable of self-government and yeah. so forth? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, um, I mean, I, I really, I do resist the notion that there is a kind of essential Russian right. affinity for autocracy right. because it, it almost seems too, too too easy or too pat an explanation and so I, I try to think about well what is it that would at least dispose them that way and one thing that I think is maybe not at least so obvious is that I mean Russia really began let's leave aside about whether it began in, in Kiev but you know in 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 Moscow, Moscovy, I mean, it, it was kind of a nucleus and then it widened, it defeated other sort of city-states and so forth. And then it, it kind of grew as an empire and just kept growing basically until it reached the Pacific shores. And it became almost too big to govern. This is almost, I think this is a perpetual problem 
in Russia, which is why, by the way, some of these exiles would love to be like to see Russia broken up so it can be more manageable. And there is a certain Russian attitude that I've heard expressed by plenty of Russians that associates democracy with uh, disorder. And there are some interesting Russian words that, that relate to democracy or uh, as a kind of like, like the the will of the people will be expressed in a very bad way if they are not kept in line, right. you know, and people fear you this. Encourage that. Well, they do, but, but it, it's, it's, it, it's somewhat ingrained. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, I think there are, the reason it's a difficult question, there are countervailing tendencies. I mean, even in the Russian Orthodox Church, you know, there's no pope. Yeah. I mean, there, there's a, and as I think we, you know, you could see in the novels of, of mm -hmm. Dostoevsky, for example, that the there's a kind of po populist expression in, in Russia that is manifest in religion and in culture. I think one of the reasons the Russians are so wonderful in, in art, you know, and, and music, uh, the, the rite of spring, is that they're, they're often seeking to, like, break break the mold. Right. So where does that come from? So, so it's, it's kind of like a lot of... Uh, unharnessed uh, energy that could be put to positive use. But I, I would like to hear what Fiona has to say. Well, I mean, it, it, you know, just to, um, because we'd, we'd like to get, there's lots of other kind of uh, questions here. I mean, this could be uh -oh. like one of those treaties, you know, that we go on for, you know, for some time, because it does come to the, you know, the problem of hyper-centralization yeah. of the Russian state. Uh, and and it and it is related to the uh, to the history, but it's also to the the great difficulties of governing you know such a vast territory, uh, with you know vast uh, spaces that um, are not not really economically viable. I mean the the Soviet Union was distorted because they kept building huge cities, you know out in the Urals and Siberia that wouldn't have yeah. you know, normally grown up there, and then they have to heavily subsidize them. So you know Russia didn't emerge like the United States did with a very strong federal station because you know we kind of grew up from the grassroots yeah. or from Canada and so all of the um, debates about how to get a more pluralistic system really kind of run you know kind of a ground when they think about how to devolve fiscal power so people like Sergei Guryev you know, and others are always thinking about yeah. that if you've got all these exiles are thinking about how could we have a more parliamentary system yes but you'd have to devolve authority the center would have to give it up and you know we have plenty of debates here in the United States don't we and we have very strong federalism but the the various powers between you know the center yeah, and the regions it's... and that's going to take some time that's what Gorbachev was trying to do right. when he tried to redo the union treaty for the Soviet Union it all fell apart so it's always going to be an issue yeah and how it how it plays and, out is a good question and, and yeah I mean I think even Putin's people have experienced this as a, a burden what one <clears throat> I went out to lunch with one of Putin's guys and he kind of confessed, I guess, in his moment of weakness or after several glasses of, of wine that, you know, he said, we're, we're just too big. You know, the problem, yeah. Paul, is that Russia is, is too big, you know, too many time zones and, you know, it, it's... So how does that change? Unless yeah, how, some... and how do you let it go? Yeah. And Navalny, of course, got poisoned when he was out the Urals in Siberia. You mentioned that yeah, before. Omsk. Siberia used to be the place of exile, and so did you know the Urals because it was just this vast interior, and it's always been also the source of, you know, kind of revolt. Uh, also against, yes. against the center. So all kinds of things are going to play out in an interesting way. If Putin dies, you know, we, we could go back to the 90s when Yeltsin, for example, kind of came in and tried to devolve authority, you know, in a kind of chaotic way because the center didn't hold. So, you know, there's all kinds of things that we could see in the future here. Yeah, thank you for your talk. I look forward to reading your book. I have a question about something that I've encountered. I teach Russian translators in the in the government, wow. and I so I can't go to Russia myself um, yeah. Yeah, for several we. reasons. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, so I, I try to keep my language up. And yeah. of course, you're aware that there's a new word for these people in Russia. They're they're not simply emigres. They're not um, uh, uh, refugees. They're relakanti. Like the, uh, which you would translate yeah. into English probably as teleworkers. Yeah, yeah. These are people who, um, <laughs> uh, I mean, if you can telework from across town, you can telework from Yerevan and Tbilisi, and yes. it's a convenient way to avoid your draft notice. That's true. Or your yeah. boyfriend's draft notice, or right. people, or it's another way to, to get out of a place that's really suffocating. Right. And so my question to you, I don't have a, I'm not trying to, to uh, push a line here. I'm curious to what your position, are these people exiles at all? Because they haven't, they haven't 
decisively cut themselves off from Russia, they could go back, especially the females, could go back tomorrow. And sometimes they do. Um, I know people like this here in D.C. They don't consider themselves like cut off from Russia in any kind of terminal way. And inside Russia, uh, also, I mean, people like Khodorkovsky. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was amazed by how many friends of mine in Russia had very negative uh, yes. ideas about him for all kinds of reasons. Yeah. These 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 That's teleworkers true. might kind of escape from that. And I, I pose this question only because of your hope mm. that these people outside of Russia might be able to have some kind of beneficial effect in Russia when Putin finally departs the scene. And, and the fact that I think there are more of these people out here than we're aware of there's a lot of them and i and and for a historical parallel i think about the effect of those soldiers who drove napoleon out of russia and went to paris and right. enjoyed yeah. the western right. style yeah. of government yeah. Bistro, style of life. Bistro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and then came the decembrists 15 yeah. years later yeah. so or 10 there, years well later. there you go so so i, I i'd like to hear you talk yeah. about if you thought about this yeah um that would be well, so, very interesting. interesting yeah very interesting perspective well to some degree i, I mean i there is a certain type of Russian who's left Russia, just as you describe, however you, you know, whatever term you want to use, largely in the tech industry, I mean, and, and some significant percentage, I mean, maybe as many as 10% or so of the tech workers, largely from places like Russia and St. Petersburg, left. Now, what's actually happened to them? I don't know that they're all still able to work back in Russia. I think that they have sort of portable skills. So they're more like what people are now describing as digital nomads. And, you know, they brought their chief asset, their brain with them, but they can be deployed in different ways. And I, I, I think some of those people are very not political. They're apolitical yeah. and they're kind of determined to be, I told you Nastia's story, you know, her husband also left, but she described him as not interested in politics at all. And he's like a, a, a tech worker. So those people, I mean, would probably, it's cheaper to live in some of these former Soviet republics, but their dream is probably to migrate, you know, westward and, you know, the jackpot might be Germany or places like that. And there are companies and, you know, entrepreneurs who've established themselves in places like Berlin. And I've talked to them. There was a yep. kind of a collapse or at least a reconfiguration of the Russian uh, company Yandex, yep. which was sometimes called Russia's Google. Uh, I wrote an article about them that's separate from the book. I mean, they they had Arkady Voloz is now in uh, Tel Aviv, you know, he's and he's reconstituting Yandex, I'm sure using, uh, or they're not calling it Yandex anymore, but using a lot of, you know, Russian, you know, uh, a lot of Russian brain power uh, down there. So I, I think we will see more variations on that. And indeed, the head of Google, one of them, Sergey Brin, is, is a you could say he was a Russian yeah, yeah. exile of a type. So I, there's not, in that sense, there's nothing quite new under the sun. And I, I ex absolutely, I expect some of these people are going to melt into these, you know, prosperous Western societies and maybe never even look back. Yeah, and, and there's just one other, you know, dimension that because you bring out in this book just the whole variety of this. This is why you said it's not kind of a, it's a cohesive or homogenous no. group, and that's kind of you know we look back through history, we saw the same thing. I mean, I noticed when I was in Germany that there were people who you wouldn't describe as exiles because they've been living there, you know, for a long time prior to the invasion of uh, Ukraine, prior probably even to annexation of Crimea, you know, for example. Um, and they were, you know, living there because it was convenient. You know, their kids were getting educated then. They were going backwards and forwards and doing work in Moscow. But now they're going backwards and forwards to Dubai. And they're still working for the same Russian companies. Yeah. But, you know, they're, they're in Dubai, uh, you know, in the Emirates. Uh, and previously they might have been in Cyprus. So a lot of these people have just, as you said, relocated. They're, but they're relocated. And they're not exiles. But they're kind of acting as if they are because of the, the circumstances. But they're still actually probably working for the same, you know, Russian companies and doing the same business as they were before. In some cases, yeah. yeah. Hello. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, one comment, uh, yeah, yeah, just related to the question. Uh, relocancy, yeah, exactly those guys who, not teleworkers, but those guys who were relocated with their companies that are massively leaving the Russia, uh, mostly tech companies. Mm -hmm. so, so they just moved, uh, they, they left their country, but uh, uh, moved with their, with their jobs. Yeah. And my question is, uh, there are, well, to, to, com uh, to comment the two popular opinions that are in from inside the Russian immigrants community, uh, one opinion is that uh, Russians think that Russians do not form diaspora compared to other people. So what, what do you think about it? Uh, 
And another thing about Russian exile, uh, people think, uh, and it's really popular opinion, that option to go to exile is actually one of the cornerstone of the Putin's regime. Mm. Uh, so uh, yeah. if you are no, uh, if you will have no such an option, you fight, you participate in unrest, uh, and something like that. Well, so could you comment on that? Yeah. Okay, I just want to make actually just what you said there. I remember years ago, um, Peskov, the press secretary of Putin. Yeah complaining about people and saying, if you don't like it in Russia, you can move. Why don't you just go to London and smell the water of the Thames? And then he revealed yeah. later that he actually had a flat in London. And I remember we're all going, oh, you know, there you go then. Yeah. You know, so it was kind of, but that's been, as you're saying, that's been a long time before. But anyway, anyway Paul. <clears throat> so, so I think um, if we just start with the, the shock of the inv full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, I mean, that was a profound shock to people in Russia. They did not expect that to happen. And the first flight, mass flight that we saw out of Russia, I don't think in any way could have been programmed, you know, by the Kremlin or, I mean, it was just an, it was a human, you know, desire to get out. Um, one of my characters featured in the, in, in the book is a, uh, a very successful uh, young Moscow man, very intelligent guy. I met him in Yervan, and his story was that uh, he has an advertising, you know, company in Moscow. He's in the midst of all kinds of projects and things. And then, you know, the invasion, it just hit him. Uh, he, he had been involved in a sort of superficial way in anti-Putin activities. He thought maybe his name was on the list. He thought, as many Russians did at the time, that Putin might seal the border because, again, Russians live sometimes, you know, they're, they're prepared for almost anything. So he got in his, you know, Mazda with his uh, dog, you know, his uh, fluffy Samoyed, and he raced, you know, towards the Latvian border, stopping only to get fulfill some sort of, you know, anti-anxiety medication. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he got to Latvia, he uh, looked around, he, he attached, he found some like blue and yellow r ribbons that he attached to the back of you know, the windshield of the car or something, so people would understand where his affinities Way. So this is, you know, this is just one story, but there were many people who liked, and eventually he ended up in, in, in Yerevan where I met him. Uh, and then there was a second wave in the fall, more or less, of 2022, when Putin uh, announced the mobilization. And, you know, then it was sort of like, I don't want any part of this war. <laughs> you know, I'm getting out. It was somewhat similar in, in ways to what you saw in during the Vietnam War, when you know some Americans, not in such enormous numbers, went to Canada, right, and just anything basically to not participate. So again, I don't think that was programmed. Now, now you know we're getting up into the what the second anniversary of the war. So I think there's there are more pr program s strategies from the Kremlin. So and there's also a rhetorical strategy. So when you hear Putin talk about the scum and all this sort of stuff then, you know, maybe there is that element that, you know, of good riddance. But still, as I, I would rest on the point that I think they do feel, they, the Kremlin, do, do feel threatened by these exiles. Because why, why are they still trying to repress them, you know, in, in Dubai and Bali and, and places like that? Yeah. Well, I think, I, I think, I think that, you know, that actually what you just said about bit there, I mean, there are people who are, you know, they're basically still working yeah. in Russian companies yes, or, yeah, you know, there are. There. and then, you know, a lot of the other people who come there have no idea. Well, the companies know, themselves well. have, yeah, have the moved, companies have like, relocated. like you say, they, they, yeah. you know, I don't know what you saw in Berlin, but the, you, you must have run actually, into, into yeah. Russian entrepreneurs and, i did i mean you know, I, I, I would it was a software really weird people experience actually because i mean i don't think i look russian but i was always being accosted on the street and asked in <laughs> russian about yeah. directions to the embassy for example uh, there was an awful lot of people they knew showing up while i was working nearby you know okay. where, where i was yeah. but i would always run into somebody who's wanting to renew their passport renew the visa right. and i'd chat to them for a while they, they relocated you know a lot of people were just thinking well it's just not a good time to be there i just like to be somewhere else but it wasn't they weren't overtly you know be, uh, looking like they were planning on being an exile so it's a very complicated no. picture i think we have somebody here who also greg pfeiffer standing in uh -oh. line who knows a few things about uh you know this uh, topic. Greg, so, uh, you know uh, <laughs> okay. I, 
hi Fiona and, and hi Paul. A really fabulous conversation. Mm -hmm. um, thank, thank you so much, uh, and really a terrific book. Congratulations, thank Paul. You. Thank uh, you. It is. I will second and third uh, my wonder at how much you've packed in there. Not only uh, history and, and, and culture, uh, but you've 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 traveled widely. You've spoken to a lot of people. You, uh, I mean, it's a it's it's a who's who, uh, and and um, I'll add that it's really very well written it's just a, it's a pleasure to read uh in the sort of the best journalistic uh tradition because you're you're rooting for uh people who want to change russia democratize russia uh but you're 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 you're, you're not judgmental the reader can make up uh, her her his mind and i, I just want to ask you about the the how much you felt talking to all these people uh and you've touched on it uh, a little bit um about the um for many quarters collective blame uh, placed on, on, on Russians. Understandable uh, as it yes. is for, uh, for not stopping Putin or for, for uh, not enough people uh, yeah. uh, uh, could, yeah. could vote in fixed elections uh, to, 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 to get him out. But what, uh, you know, how heavily does it weigh on um, the, you know, this or that sector of the, the exile community? Uh, and, and what do you feel about uh, Western governments, uh, the sort of European Union, uh, the U.S., uh, are, are we doing enough? Are we, are, are we doing anything yeah. uh, to help this community? Right. What, what, what should we be doing? Well, yeah, no, I'm glad you asked that. that Just before you question. answer, Greg, though, um, you know, Brad has given me the, the signal. Okay. But there sadly has to be, you know, the last question. So, you know, also in responding to Greg, you know, parting thoughts, but also encouraging thoughts for everybody to go get the book right now. And then um, Paul will be signing uh, copies as, um, as soon as uh, as soon as we finish. So, Paul, it's all yeah. yours. Okay. Well, thank you for the questions. And, um, you know, when you start one of these book projects, you're, you're always, you're kind of hoping, you know, to be surprised by, by something uh, and not, you know, you think all kinds of things that, you know, maybe you'll you'll learn, and then you get you know sort of wonderfully surprised and jolted. So I was surprised, you know, from the beginning. Whenever I was in contact with with any any almost any of the exiles, how freely they sort of c confessed some sense of of guilt or shame. And okay, not quite the same thing, but the way one exile explained it to me was, okay, I don't feel guilty personally. Guilty, I did not kill anyone, but but. Someone in my family killed someone, and so for that I feel shame. So, if the idea of the Russian nation, in some sense, is as a family, then you can see where that sense of of, of both both guilt and shame might come from. And so sometimes I felt like you know they were almost like uh, they were, I was, they're, you know, the confessor. You know they were they were. What, what could I say? I mean, one of the uh, writers I talked to in Tbilisi wanted me to, uh, you know opine on whether she was guilty or not. And I mean, I think just in asking that question, she had pretty much already answered the fact that she, in some way, I don't believe in collective guilt, but for example, you know, all these uh, Ukrainian children uh, up to military age were pretty much for, forcibly taken out of, of Russia, as, uh, Ukraine, as you know, and put into various kinds of, you know, re-education camps and so forth. So, who is guilty there? I mean, you know, it's not just the regime. What about the people in, in the, the Russians in the, the camps, the people who are preparing the food and all that sort of stuff? It extends, I think it permeates. And so it, it's, I think it is something pr profound in the, in the sort of Russian consciousness, this sense of, of guilt that, that other people react against. I mean, if you're with Putin, then you, you might angrily, you know, deny that there's any sense of guilt. And I've been in, you know, a, a, a silent witness to really verbally violent discussions between Russians on both sides in the same room where, you know, you just like, wow, it's, it's raw. It's really raw. I don't think that the Western governments are doing enough uh, with respect to the exiles that you're talking about. And I feel strongly about this uh, for several reasons. Uh, first of all, um, as somebody who loves Russian literature and is married to a, a native Russian speaker uh, who is from uh, Tashkent and who can better quote Pushkin than anything from, you know, the Uzbek language she doesn't speak. I know in my heart that, you know, there are, you know, good Russians. And, you know, my wife, Nargiza, to whom this book is dedicated, is a 
not a terribly political person, but she pays a lot of attention to the, you know, the, the Russian, the media, the exile literature and stuff. Like, and in her heart is very much, you know, against uh, Putin and on the side of the Ukrainians in this war. I also don't like being preached to all the time, like when I was in Ukraine, about, you know, the Russian language and who's using it and who's not using it. I mean, some people say, well, Russian is the language of, of your oppressor. But, you know, guess what? There are, there are Ukrainians who speak Russian on the front lines in Ukraine who were dying, sacrificing their lives, you know, against Russian speaking Russian soldiers. And so, you know, I don't this this whole idea that that uh, it's it, there's this essential opposition, you know, between Ukraine and Russia. And, for example, with with language, I don't buy. So I would like President Biden to give a speech that acknowledges some of these issues and tensions, even though it might get some of the Ukrainians bad. And for example, you know, if these exiles are being cracked down on in places like, you know, comedians and musicians and in these diaspora communities, it's, it's simply for the freedom of expression that we stand for. I think there should be support for that. But I also think it's in our national interest, just as it was during the Cold War, to stand up for a certain kind of cultural and political resistance. So they haven't done that, but, you know, I think it's still, it's a missed opportunity that perhaps could still be realized. Well, uh, Paul, and thank you, Greg, and to everybody else um, who asked questions. Um, I do hope that people get the book and buy lots of other books because, as um, Brad said, we need a new sound system in here. <laughs> uh, and Paul will now be um, signing uh, copies of the book. And as I think you've already um, heard, it really is a great read. I mean, I was just amazed at how well he packed in so much information into very tight, very readable prose. I mean, you could, you know, read it tonight, yeah. you know, before you go to bed. It's a thank, great book. Okay. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, copies of Paul's book are available at the checkout desk up front. And please form a line to the right of the table and help our staff by holding up your chairs.